live from Barcelona, Spain, it's theCUBE, covering Cisco Live 2018. Brought to you by Cisco, Veeam, and theCUBE's ecosystem partners. Hey, welcome back everyone. This is theCUBE's exclusive coverage live in Barcelona, Spain for Cisco Live 2018 in Europe. I'm John Furrier, the co-founder and co-host of theCUBE. Uh, here all week, two days of live wall-to-wall -wall coverage in the DevNet zone for all the actions. That's the biggest story at Cisco Live is the impact of the DevNet and the developer network that's been growing leaps and bounds. Of course, we covered DevNet Create earlier uh, last year, which is a cloud native event, kind of bringing two communities together from Cisco. And of course, we can't talk about developers without talking about experiences that developers need and want and expect, and also you know, how to operate in those environments. We have two great guests. Mandy Whaley's been on before, Cube alumni, director of developer experiences at Cisco, and Tom Davies, who's the senior manager of the DevNet Sandbox. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you to again. Yeah, good so to see So congratulations. You um, DevNet is again booming. It's the hot part of the show. It's one of the top stories yes. here in Barcelona. The, it's been great. Our workshops where we're doing the hands-on coding have been extremely full, even early in the morning and late into the evening. And it's great to see people really diving in, laptops open, getting their hands on and doing some coding. That's great stuff, congratulations. And you know, the sandbox is interesting because now you guys are completely open, love the motto, learn, code, inspire, and connect. That's the motto here. You got to have a place for people to do this. You yeah. do. What is the sandbox thing that you guys are rolling out? It's pretty interesting. Yeah, so the sandbox is completely open to everyone and uh, the, the idea behind it is if you like, if you can go to developer.cisco.com slash sandbox, you can hit our catalog and start playing with our technology within minutes by just clicking on the technology you want to cover and we'll spin you up that environment and you can start playing as a developer really quite quickly. All right, talk, take me through a progression example because let's just say I hit that website, yeah. developer.cisco.com slash sandbox, what do I do? I mean, what are people doing? Is it like, you know, hello world? Or, you know, were they coding? Are they learning? I mean, it, what's going on it there? It does depend on the technology that they choose. So, we go to developer.cisco.com slash sandbox, hit catalog, it comes up with a bunch of tiles. And in, in that catalog, you can choose networking, you could choose security, you could choose data center, cloud, open source, any different technology that that developer might be interested in or want to integrate into. And then from there, they click on that tile and say, right, I want to reserve, say, APKM. I'm interested in net, uh, networking and controller of networking. From there, we spin that environment up for them, completely secure, send them the details of how to connect. They connect to it, and then they are free to start coding within minutes on, say, uh, APKM controller solution, figure out what the latest release provides them, how they integrate into it, and how they can start innovating in a really so can, easy a, way It's a the playground, top. they can do mashups. It's a playground, it is. Yeah. They can sling APIs around, test stuff, break stuff. And yes. we, if they're breaking something, <laughs> they're probably doing something right, so we yeah. encourage it. Yeah. 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 The other th thing that's really cool about the Sandbox is that Tom takes a lot of time and care to make sure we put together fully, you know, environments where you can actually build things with the Cisco gear plus open source projects that are relevant to those pieces of the Cisco technology portfolio. So it's not just the environment, it's sample code, it's open source you can use, it's traffic generation, so it's really a full working environment. Yeah, that brings up a good point. I wanted to ask you, because we had some other guests on, we couldn't get to it, but um, you know, you're starting to see with Kubernetes, um, and, and well first Docker containers, and now all containers, um, really interesting, I mean, Red Hat just got just bought CoreOS yesterday. Yeah. Big they news. Yeah, they big did. news. <laughs> in yeah. Europe, you miss all the action. Yeah. State of the Union. <laughs> I know. You know, the big story in the New York Times yeah. on Sunday. I'm like, oh, I'm missing all the, all the news. <laughs> but that's a signal. Containers are commoditized. You're seeing that be the now abstraction layer for moving workloads around and, and program around it. We Kubernetes do. gives an orchestration opportunity that now allows you to bring this service mesh concept to the table. This is becoming a really interesting developer dream because now I can provision yes. microservices and start doing network services with those microservices, the app layer. Yeah. This to me is a really, really big trend. I know you guys have kind of quietly put it out there called a term called net DevOps, yes. which I think will be a very big thing <laughs> yeah. because it's DevOps for the whole stack. It is. Right. But yeah. really using the network more. So for the people who are power users of network services, this could become a very big DevOps movement. Yes, yes. Can you explain this concept of the net DevOps? And 
Does that relate to like Istio and some of the, some of the service mesh stuff out there? What's your yeah? Do you want to start with service mesh and then I'll dive into the the the, the lower parts or we yeah. can do go it. for it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah so sir. The term service mesh is actually fairly new and it's coming because as people use microservices more, they're understanding that they just proliferate like crazy and it's actually really quite hard to understand which microservices talking to which microservices are they doing it securely are they within policy are they talking to the right thing and that's where Istio comes in uh, it's really um, providing a, a proxy for that traffic so you can easily talk between microservice A and microservice B understand it see observability between that traffic and then control that traffic and Istio is taking the, the really at the abstraction away and taking the pain away from well, that Just huge talk service. about the quantify that time savings because I mean, this is like, I think this really kind of was the minds get blown. You just, that example you just laid out, without that, what would you have to do? I'd have to build a proxy, I'd have to test it. You do. I mean, yeah. just take me through it. <laughs> the comparisons, A to B, <laughs> well, real quick. Normally when you have a microservice, you'd probably have about 15 other services around it, or like a, if you had a ton of microservices, you'd probably have a diff 15 different sub-serving services around it. With Istio, it takes 15 away, so you don't have to manage or operate all those, and it brings it down to one, and that's really super key, because it makes it so yeah. much easier yeah. to deal yeah. with microservices yeah. and develop them out. I mean, I boil it down, I tell people when Amazon la launched Lambda, uh, which is essentially the serverless trend, yeah. they're always a service, it's never really serverless. <laughs> I know the Cisco people debate this all the time, and others, it's true, there's servers behind it. They just take this abstraction away. They're really enabling this notion of a mindset for the developer where this gets into the user experience, user right. expectation. Yes. If I want infrastructure as a code and I don't want to dive into the network services, I want the one, not the 15, to deal with. Yeah. Right. I'm essentially programming the infrastructure at that point. So this is a big effing deal. This is, is a big deal. And then even what we're seeing is that the, the expectations are set by DevOps practices. And now that our network devices are opening up APIs, and we have the really strong um, assurance and analytics pieces that we saw in the Cisco keynotes, we can extend those DevOps concepts to managing network devices. So something very traditional networking tasks like add a VLAN. Let's say you want to do that, but you want to do that in a network as code manner. So you want to take that through a build pipeline, something that would be familiar to a developer or someone who manages their infrastructure in a DevOps way, but now you can do it for a networking device and you can take it through build and test, just like you would code, and all of your network configurations are, are source controlled, so you have your version control around it, and that's a, that's a big mind shift for the yeah. network developers. But in DevNet, we have the application developers, the ops engineers, and the networkers, and what we're trying to do is share those practices yeah. across, because that's the only way we'll get to the scale, the consistency, yeah. the level of automation that we need. All right, so here's a question for you guys, put you on the spot. DevOps has been great, it's going mainstream. Some are called cloud yeah. ops, whatever, but DevOps is great, great movement. Yes. That's been going on for a while, you know, hey, yep. you know, <laughs> pat each other on the back. <laughs> but DevOps means automation, yes. right? Yes. And the old rule is if you have to do it twice, automate it. This scares people. So what is being autom auto automated away in the net DevOps model? So I wouldn't know that it's being automated away, but the idea is that if we're managing infrastructure, Traditionally, you would do it in a sequential and manual way, right? But we need to do it in a parallel and automated way. And so moving towards that automation helps us do that. I think we see some network engineers who think, I have to learn a lot of new skills to do this. Mm -hmm. And that is true, um, but it's you don't have to be the level of an application developer who's writing applications to do some automation and scripting. And DevNet's really working to put the tools out there to yeah. lead them down that path and, and get them moving in that direction. And it's also a little bit more, I mean, DevOps is definitely the automation and the tools. There's yeah. also the culture of bringing yeah. Dev and Ops together. Um, so the same thing happens there as well. Totally agree, and also the process as well, repeatability in what we're doing. So yes. once you've done it one and that process yeah. works for you, you can repeat that process yeah. for the next set of configuration you're deploying. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, slick. Rowan um, showed on stage the future titles of what it'll be like in 2030 or 2050, I forget yes. which year it was. Yes. Um, I joked, it says LinkedIn on that, might not even be around, not, might, might be around then either. <laughs> um, but this is a new field. Right, yes. and, and successful companies, um, the ethos was hire the smartest person because the jobs that are coming haven't been invented yet, so there's no like, experience there. So this kind of reminds me of what's going on with DevOps where you know, network guys, they're not dumb. I mean, they're smart. Super right? smart. So they, you know, 
Yeah. And it used to be that you were the rock star if you ran the network. That's right. Okay, now That's the right. rock stars are more the app developers and the developers on the DevOps side. So the it would be easy, and we're seeing that it's easy for those guys to jump in to some of these coding and or agile mindsets. Yes. Because they are gunslingers, they are rock stars. They are, yeah. it's incredible how fast they're picking it up. I mean, they are, the, just from ones that we've met from last year to this year who are here, came to like a, their first coding class. This year they're here and they're like, oh yeah, I totally get this build pipeline. I'm doing this in my organization. We're seeing them pick it up incredibly fast. And so they obviously see a, a path to other jobs. What patterns are you guys seeing in terms of things that they're doing on the sandbox and or yeah. some of the user expectations that they have as they're now fresh, young, or and you know, yeah. middle-aged or old students right. in the new world? What are some of the patterns? Yeah. What are they kicking tires on? What's that, oh. What are they gravitating towards? Everything, but they, they <laughs> they're literally everything, but they, um, they're they always like, quite interested in containers and what's happening in the container world and how that applies to networking, especially because as we touched on earlier, there's a lot of networking to be had in the container world and it's not just one layer of Istio or service mesh, there's also virtualization layers, there's like abstracted policy layers, there's a good few layers yeah. of networking that you need to know and really understand to be able to get into. So that's one real trend that uh, the network yes. guys really are jumping on and so they should because they're great at it. Yeah, so. I would add to that, like I've been seeing um, you know, in different conversations I have with people who are coming from the the app dev side or the ops side and saying, wow, I've done, I'm really good at containers. I can build apps and containers all day. And then they get into it and they're like, the networking part of containers is hard. There's a lot <laughs> yeah. to learn. Yeah. And so I definitely see a lot of activity around both sides coming together around how yeah. do we really make that work. And and the bottom line is, is that the whole, this whole, your job's going away is ridiculous because this really proves that there is so much job security in DevOps, it's, it's there's, ridiculous. There's more devices per engineer to be managed than ever before, yeah, yeah. so it's really just, you yeah. have to have the automation to even keep up, yeah, right? I would, it's quite funny actually, because I come from a very much a software-centric background, yeah, and networking too. to me, was black magic. You had to know yeah. so much stuff in the networking world. It used to yeah. scare the hell out of me. And but I had to go down into the network layer to start understanding it to do a better job of software. Well, you was locked down. I mean, you reverse. had perimeter-based security, you and you had very inflexible configuration management things. You yeah. were really locked down. Now, right. agile and, and dynamic, yeah. adaptive, and these yeah. are the words that are described. And now add IoT to the mix. You guys have the black hat. You know, IoT yeah. yes. booth here, which is phenomenal, yes. is only going to increase the edge of the network. Definitely. Which is new, not new to Cisco. Cisco knows the edge. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see that going forward. Yeah, so. definitely. And, and that's one of our sandboxes. We have a sandbox where developers can practice taking Docker containers and deploying them into edge compute in our routers. And that's one that's really popular. And gets it's a lot of incredibly out. popular, yeah. yeah. Mandy and Tom, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate it. Great to see you yeah, again. Congratulations you so on your success. Uh, go kick on the tires on the sandbox. <laughs> doing a great <laughs> job. DevNet, developer network for Cisco here, and of course, DevNet created a, a separate small boutique event, small um, um, for the cloud native world. You want to check that out, well, Cube will be there this year. This is theCUBE live coverage, I'm John Furrier. Stay tuned for more of day two, exclusive Cisco Live 2018 in Europe. We'll be right back. <laughs>